In the forest, a dissonant bird choir sang on the trees, and along the road, a pair of horses drove a cart, tapping out a sonorous rhythm with their hooves. The girl ordered, turning to Elisa, that this time there would be no scenes. Elisa Verdier answered her older sister in a childish way, that at the last dinner party it was just incredibly boring, and she couldn't do anything about it. Shrugging her shoulders, she asked how she knew that a few glasses of sherry could get her so drunk. The girl was sure that this time it would be much more fun. She asked her sister's opinion on this matter, but she only smiled slightly. Chloe assured her sister that he really should curb his temper. She reported that this ball was arranged by none other than the Duke of Tees himself, and she believed that Alice should have found a potential partner. The younger sister said that she was well aware that the engagement was the only thing that could save their family from complete ruin. Elisa sadly admitted that she always hoped to find a person whose feelings would cover her head over heels. Chloe gripped the handle of her cane. She said she was sorry, and everything could have been different, if only her leg had not been in such a condition. The girl sadly thought that she would really hate to have to put such a burden on her younger sister, and she believed that it was her fault. The carriage bounced on the bumps and unevenness of the forest road, and the tackle creaked mercilessly. The girl sat down closer to Chloe. She hugged and nuzzled her cheek. The younger one said that her sister had nothing to regret, and if anyone was to blame, it was their father. After all, because of his insane love for his mother, because of which he squandered his entire fortune on medical bills, and it was he who was completely unable to cope with the management of the estate. Chloe asked her sister to remember what happened three years ago. Then, despite their difficult family circumstances, their father allowed Duke Tisu's army to use their castle. The younger sister continued her speech. She said that he was their father. However, she couldn't say for sure if he had a heart of gold or just a fool. Alice asked her sister if she had heard the rumors about Duke Thys. She assured that there was not a single good thing about him. Some said that he was a young duke, and he led his soldiers to a great victory. But there were also rumors that he became the father of several illegitimate children from his mistresses, but then he secretly executed them. It was said that the man had a disgusting character, and if he was to fall under the hot hand of that person, he could completely crush him, not paying attention to the titles. And many thought that it would be better if he died on the battlefield. Chloe hugged her sister. She assured that, considering the situation of their family, they were lucky that they were invited to such an event at all. Alice argued that even if it was so, then the Duke was not the person to be associated with. Ominous rumors surrounded the man, and they had no idea what his true intentions were. The youngest of the sisters expressed the hope that she would not run into that man while she was enjoying the festivities. Chloe sighed and reassured her sister that they would have to welcome the Duke, since he was the host here. The girl bit her lip in worry. The girl gripped her cane tighter with both hands. She told herself that she couldn't let fear take control of her. The action takes us back three years to the Verdi estate. It was a snowy winter. Then Viscount Verdier, lord of the small castle, gladly opened the gates for the imperial army as it retreated. The girl, leaning on a cane, limped through the snow. Two guys were discussing that this was Verdi's eldest daughter, and she was crippled. Dvugoy was surprised how she could care for someone in such a state, and there were doubts whether she would become just a burden. The girl heard all this but did not show it. His associate advised to leave her alone. He believed that the cripple simply wanted to help. Two men watched from a distance as the lame-legged girl bandaged the wounded man's arm. The man with the mustache and beard said that he did not complain at all, and he considered this girl a true delight for the eyes, and he thought her face was pretty. In the room, the girl was waiting for a dinner that had been covered and cooled for a long time. A young servant entered. He told Chloe that his grace had asked her to leave the wounded in the care of the servants. With a sigh, the girl sat down on the edge of the bed. She understood that she made her father worry, but she was also aware of the responsibility for the wounded. After all, it represented their pain, what they suffered, and what makes them stand on the edge of life and death. Soldiers with bandages on their hands sat on stumps near the fire. The fire crackled, and they were cooking something for dinner in the cauldron. Chloe limped to the window. She looked at the temporary camp. She was always taught that a nobleman's debt comes to the aid of the disadvantaged and the weak, and she sympathized and wanted to help the wounded soldiers. She heard the command, attention, and involuntarily shuddering at the surprise, began to look more closely at what was happening outside the window. Greet the commander. They gave the command again. A tall, blonde man stood in front of the lined-up soldiers who saluted him. Chloe saw the commander for the first time. Her eyes widened and she froze in place. The man said that today afternoon, he received news of the death of his father, Wilhelm von Tissa. That was beheaded by the enemy, who decided to hang his head on the walls of his castle. The soldiers on the formation began to snort, 
The commander asked one of those standing in the first row if he wanted to return home. The soldier was amazed and hesitated to answer. Herzog summarized that it was not like what he wanted. The guy began to disbelieve his ego, and he said that on the contrary, he very much wants. The soldier sadly admitted that his wife had recently given birth to a child while he was here, and he wanted more than anything in the world to see the two of them. The commander asked the second soldier who was older. He answered that he was worried about his sick and lonely mother, whom he had to leave alone. The third man said that he had to work to feed his younger brother, so that he would not starve. The fourth assured that his bride was waiting for his return. Chloe could hear the desperation in the voices through the glass. The duke said that as they see everything, there were many reasons why they should end this war and return to their homes. He said, standing in front of the ranks of his soldiers, that the same thing applied to him. After all, he could not take away his father's body, let alone hold a funeral for his repose. The commander reminded them that wars are not won or lost by God's will. That is why he refused to retreat. The duke claimed that he would do everything to lead his soldiers to victory, and in the end, he was convinced that this was a matter of pride and dignity of the Tees house. This was a speech by Damien von Tysa before the soldiers of the Imperial Army, of which he was the commander. Chloe stood by the window. Her heart was beating fast. Now all her attention was riveted by Damien von Tysa, and the young duke told the soldiers that now it was up to them to embody their despair and longing, which they had shown him in action. People in rows raised their hands in a sign of ego support and agreement, and the girl at the window was overflowing with emotions. She was surprised how the commander immediately managed to raise the morale of the soldiers, and she considered him a more outstanding person than she imagined. On the street in the evening snow, rows of wounded soldiers greeted their commander, shouting, Tis. The duke was pleased with the impression made. At some point, he looked up and saw a girl at the window, who was watching everything with interest, lost his vigilance and self-control. Chloe was instantly frightened. She realized that she had been careless, succumbing to instinctive curiosity and forgetting about tact and ethics. The girl jerked away from the glass, carelessly knocked a saucer from the windowsill onto the floor. She sat down by the wall and covered her mouth with her hand, blaming herself that their eyes had only just met. Gathering a little courage, she decided to stealthily look out the window one more time. The duke was already leaving his soldiers with a quick step to their enthusiastic shouts. Chloe fell to her knees on the floor. She breathed out the emotions she had experienced and tried to calm the arising storm of feelings. She herself admitted that she would never have been able to do something similar after hearing about the death of her father. The girl kneeled down and began to pray. She asked the higher forces to allow these soldiers to return home so that they can take care of their loved ones. The commander himself said that he hoped that the longing of his soldiers would bear fruit in battle. Chloe looked to see if anyone was there. She thought that she should hurry up and return before everyone woke up. She limped along the corridor, but suddenly a male voice called out to her. Lady Chloe? The girl stopped. She was overtaken by Gilles, a young servant of the mansion. The girl's cane slipped, and the girl herself tripped. Chloe began to fall, but the guy deftly grabbed her by the waist. The girl smiled and thanked him for saving her. Gilles wondered where she was going so early in the morning. He believed that only yesterday evening his grace had asked her to stay in her room. The girl assured that she would like to collect some medicinal herbs in the forest. She smiled and showed him the basket. The guy assured that he could do it himself for the lady. Chloe said that it is not known what they will do if he collects poisonous herbs, as he did last time. He scared everyone. Jill was confused and confused. The girl assured him that she would be calmer if she gathered the herbs herself. The guy said, agreeing with the lady's opinion that it could be so but he believed that it was unsafe, and the air, in his opinion, was cold enough. And the girl's father was worried about his daughter's health. Chloe assured him that there was no reason to worry. She said that she had already gone somewhere on her own many times. Gilles was sad. The girl was already leaving, and he asked her to be careful. The girl thought that when they first met, the boy's head barely reached her shoulder. She did not notice when he managed to grow so much. Further actions take the reader to the winter forest. The sun was just beginning to cast warm rays on the frozen ground. Chloe plucked green leaves of medicinal herbs, which were not afraid of the frost, and hid in the ground itself. She thought that everyone worked so hard, and she wanted to be useful too. Suddenly there was a rustle. The girl interrupted the lesson on collecting plants and became wary. On the shore of the reservoir she saw the Duke of Tis. The man looked at the reflection of the forest in the water. Chloe was surprised that Duke Tis was here at such an early hour of the day. The man felt that he was being watched. The girl was sitting on the snow, holding a cane with her hand. She hoped that no one but her knew about this place. And something told her that it would be better not to bother the Duke now. She was going to leave as quietly as possible, 
but she stepped on a dry leaf with a cane. The sound gave away her presence. The Duke asked, Who's here? Chloe froze in place. The basket of leaves fell from her hands and hit the ground. The man demanded to be named. He approached the girl with quick steps. She apologized to his lordship, and he bowed his head in front of the tall man, saying that she was Chloe Verdier, the daughter of Victor Verdier. The commander said that he noticed a pattern last night, and he took a step closer to the girl. But she looked at him with the eyes of a driven doe. The duke said that it seemed to him that the eldest daughter of Verdi had a habit of spying on people like a little rat. Chloe humbly bowed her head, apologized if she offended him, and she swore by her name that she had not done anything like that now. The man asked if her words meant that she did it yesterday, and he assumed that her father ordered his daughter to pounce on him in order to seduce him. The girl was stunned by such a statement. The commander continued to rant. He said that Lord Verdier was not as naive as he seemed, and he considered him an ambitious person. Chloe assured that everything was not like that at all. The duke grinned. He asked why even then a girl would put herself on display, treating the hideous pus-filled wounds of his soldiers. The man said that at least Verdi's house had a low position, but he believed that such work did not suit a noblewoman, especially in her state of health. The girl was amazed. She asked herself if this was really the same person she saw yesterday before the formation of the soldiers, and she considered his behavior rude. Chloe replied that she was just trying to help those who went to war to protect their families, and she said that she did not expect that her title would become such a problem. The girl said that her late mother taught them that even though their family was insignificant in terms of its position, but they, as nobles, are obliged to come to the aid of those in need. She believed that this was exactly the kind of behavior the nobles expected. The man smiled back at her and hung over her with his whole body. He asked Chloe if it had occurred to her that trying to do something beyond her capabilities was not only presumptuous, but also created inconvenience for others. Herzog said that if only Chloe could hear the dirty jokes the men were telling while she was hobbling between them, and he was not sure if she would be able to keep her head so high. The man was surprised that after that she had said something to him about the noblewoman's behavior. He said that it would be better if her father did not hear such a story and he admitted that if he were in his place, he would cut off the head of anyone who would dare to tarnish his daughter's name. The duke touched Chloe's hair, brushing it away from her face. He said that his soldiers saw dozens of their comrades killed in battle, and he asked if she knew what it did to a man. He scolded her that it wasn't even dawn yet, and she was already wandering around the forest alone with her sore leg. He asked that if something had happened to her, who would be to blame for it? Chloe said that this land became part of Verdier's estate long before her birth, and no one dares to enter this territory without permission. She was sure that it was completely safe here. The man smirked. He asked if she would continue to carry this nonsense if he did it, and he snatched the cane from her hands. The girl was shocked. She tried to get her back, but the duke did not allow her to do so. The duke quickly planted the cane in the body of the snake that crawled next to the girl. Blood from the reptile's wound spilled onto the ground. He said that there is always danger in the forest. He considered her reckless if she thought otherwise, and he pulled out the cane from the already motionless body of the snake. The blonde examined the cane. He said that it was damaged, but the girl should have been able to return to the castle. The girl said that it was not worth it, and expressed words of gratitude to the duke. He said that he could see that she had no temper, and he admitted that it was a surprise for him. The man lowered himself into a crouch next to Chloe. He lifted the hem of her dress and asked to be allowed to examine her leg. The duke asked the girl if her illness was hereditary. She was amazed by his insight. She asked him why he continues to behave so rudely. Tisa hesitated for a while, continuing to stand before her on one knee. When the duke got up, he answered her, that she was too sensitive, that he simply asked her a question, and she already took it as a blow. He told Lady Chloe that if she let her emotions get the better of her, she would only lose. The girl raised her head, and looking directly into the duke's eyes, said that she was not a soldier, and now she was not going to war. His lordship assured her that life was a continuous battle, and this was especially true for people like her. Chloe replied that maybe it was like that, but she thought that this was still no reason to poke her nose into her life. He replied that he only wanted to give her advice. Herzog claimed that her reluctance to thank him was due to the fact that he touched her for life. It seemed to the girl that there was a devil in human form in front of her. She decided for herself that she should not have any illusions about him. Holding the hem of the dress, she decided to tell him two things with all respect for his lordship. The duke nodded in agreement and said, I'm asking for mercy. The girl said that at first it was about the cane that he damaged. After all, she needed it. Ticey assured, smiling that he would talk to the carpenter as soon as he returned from the barracks. 
But the girl answered no, and she said that she would like a cane made of birch, which grows in the duchy of Tees. The man narrowed his eyes. He asked the girl to repeat her request one more time. Chloe said that she remembered how he said yesterday that he would return from the war victorious. The man smiled lightly, and the girl continued, that in the end, one day he will return to the duchy of Tees, and she would like him to make her a cane from his own birch. The man reached his hands to her shoulders. He caressed strands of her hair and called the girl, my lady, and he said that if he gave her something better. The girl rolled her eyes. Herzog said that it seemed to him that Chloe's father definitely wanted something more, and this brought him to the second point. The girl pushed the blonde's hands away from her. The girl replied that if her father praised his daughters in the presence of his lordship, then he did it exclusively because of his paternal love for them and his sister. Chloe said that at least her father loved and adored his children, but he was not so detached from life that he forgot that Verdi's house did not compare with the situation of the house of Thysi. The girl said that the duke was not the only one who would prefer not to associate with an inferior woman. She was sure that the same applies to absolutely all men. The duke coldly asked Chloe to save her self-deprecation for the diary. The girl replied that when it came to the truth, there could be no humiliation. She turned and limped away from the duke. Chloe said that she wanted to make it clear that he could feel sorry for her, but so that he would not dare to think that she was unhappy or that her life was like constant defeats. The duke asked what it meant that she was happy living like that. The girl stopped. He said that nothing will ever change in her life. Chloe said that she was satisfied, that she likes to live a peaceful, unchanged life in the place where she was born until the end of her days. At these words, the duke's eyes widened. She assured that this was what happiness was for her. The girl did not remember well how she returned to the castle after the collision with the Duke of Tees, but she remembered that all the way the cold morning wind enveloped her like a snake that she had seen in the forest. Our heroine was lying in bed. Her face was burning. Gilly came up and told the lady that the Duke of Tees and his men had just left the castle. The girl thanked him for letting her know. It was a long time before Chloe dared to return to that forest. Events bring us back to the present. The girls arrived at the palace. They climbed the steps to the front entrance, lined with an expensive red carpet. The sisters entered the castle of the Tees house. Alice said that she could not believe that this castle was used only for the Duke's entertainment and only during one season per hour. She thought it was simply ridiculous. The sister took the younger one instructively. Elisa sighed noisily and said that she was already tired. But here they turned to her. The girl was surprised at the meeting. She said that it was wonderful to see Lord Cormier again. The man smiled in response to the greeting. Lord held out his hand and asked if he could be so impudent as to invite Alice Verdier to the next dance. But she answered that she would gladly agree to his proposal. And as if accidentally remembered, the girl introduced her sister Chloe to the man. Lord bowed politely, and Chloe said that it was a great honor for her to meet him. He assured that when it came to meeting her sister, Lady Alice, it was rather an honor for him. The guy said that maybe they could dance with her later. But when he saw the cane, he collapsed. The guy felt uncomfortable and began to scratch the back of his head in puzzlement. Chloe replied, getting the Lord out of his awkward position, that the sight of all these beautiful dancing couples in itself gave her pleasure. And she assured, smiling, that she really appreciates such attention from him. The musicians played another winding dance melody on the violin. Chloe watched as Lord Cormier and her sister circled in the dance, enjoying themselves. She was glad that everyone seemed to have already forgotten about the scene that Elisa arranged for the last time. She believed that Count Cormier could be a good match for Alice. After all, she had never heard anyone mention him in a disgusting sense, and his intentions seemed sincere to her. The girl felt that she was happy, and she wondered if this meant that she should say words of gratitude to Duke Tees. Chloe thought that she would prefer to avoid him if possible, but it could seem impolite from the outside. She wondered why he had invited them here. It could all be because their father helped him a year ago, as Elisa told her. But Chloe remembered the Duke's words back then in the forest. The man then asked if it had occurred to her that trying to do something beyond her capabilities was not only presumptuous, but also stupid, because it caused inconvenience to others. Chloe realized that the Duke did not look at all like a man who appreciated kindness. There was commotion and noise all around, and Chloe thought that there was hope that Duke Tiss could completely forget who she was. She gripped the cane more firmly with both hands. A man was coming down the stairs. They started whispering and chattering in the hall. There were occasional shouts that it was the Duke with an appeal to look there. The girl heard footsteps and the rattle of a weapon next to her. Without looking up, she staggered to her feet and greeted His Highness the Duke of Tees. The man said that a lot of time had passed since their last meeting. 
He said that he remembered very well Lady Chloe from the house of Verdier. The Duke said that he was greatly indebted to her father, the Viscount, for his help three years ago. He assured that he would like to thank him personally, but he was too busy all this time. The guests looked at the couple. The man expressed his gratitude that they accepted his invitation. Chloe bowed her head and told his lordship that it was an honor for them to be here. Tisa said that if he didn't ask too much, he could ask the girl to dance. The girl looked at him with bewilderment. The guests began to whisper what was going on in his lordship's mind, and they wondered how he could not see the cane in that girl. There were also those who assumed that the girl had done something that could cause enmity in the house of Tisa, and felt sorry for the poor girl. Chloe told his lordship that she offered him her most sincere apologies. The girl said that she was afraid that she was not skilled enough to be his dance partner, and she herself thought that he had not changed at all since then. The duke asked if the girl refused him because too many other men had already invited her, and he would have to wait his turn. He said that if it was so, then he hoped that she did not ask him to refuse in this way, assuring that he would very much like to dance with her. The girl ostentatiously placed the cane in front of him and leaned on it with her hand. A second man hurried up to them. Instead of congratulating him, he blamed Damien for again torturing an innocent young lady. The blonde asked if he didn't see that the poor girl was about to burst into tears. It was none other than Johannes, the first prince of the kingdom of Swangon. He said that the girl had already rejected the duke's proposal, and he assured him that it was not very gentlemanly to continue pestering her insistently. The prince slyly asked the duke whether he had really forgotten all manners while he was on the battlefield. Demian said that inviting a beautiful woman to a dance was not a violation of etiquette. The duke assured the prince that Lady Chloe was not one of those who could easily burst into tears. Johannes put his hand on the duke's shoulder, and he apologized to the girl on behalf of his cousin for behaving so rudely with her. Chloe just bowed her head in silence. At some point, the girl raised her head. He told his highness that she believed that his lordship was only concerned about the fact that she could remain unclaimed without a gentleman until the end of the ball. Chloe asked the prince to take back his apology. Johannes was amazed. He hovered over the girl, and I was surprised at what a smart young lady she was. I asked what her name was, but she answered that her name was Chloe Verdier, that she was the eldest daughter of Verdier. The prince rested his hand on Chloe's shoulder. She even staggered from his weight, and he said that he would like to personally meet with the vicar. Aye. He said that he was intrigued by a man who managed to raise such a beautiful and brave daughter. Chloe was bowing at her feet. She asked his highness for forgiveness, and she said that today she was here with her younger sister, not with her father. But then the girl came to her senses and thought to herself that she had not seen Alice for some time. And now I would like to know where she went. She tried to look for her sister among the dancers, but in vain. Chloe thought that she had been here not so long ago. The prince chuckled and asked her to introduce his sister later, because he was a little busy right now. Johannes, laughing, beckoned the duke to come with him, beckoning him with his hand, and asked him to remove this sullen expression on his face. The heart in our heroine's chest made jumps, accelerating the pulsation of the whole body. She was overwhelmed by her overwhelming emotions. She tried to understand where her sister Elisa could go, and I really hoped that she would not get into any trouble again. The duke asked Lady Chloe where her sister had gone. The girl shuddered all over. She replied that the ballroom was so huge that she could not see her, and she was going to immediately go to look for her. The girl almost cried because she was worried about her younger sister. The duke grinned. He asked Chloe Verde if she remembered the earlier arrangement, and he put his hand on top of the girl's hand on her cane, squeezed it a little with his fingers. The man spoke in her ear, reminding them of their secret agreement regarding her cake. She replied that if he wasn't going to hand her a new cane, then let go of her hand right now. Damien asked her not to worry, and promised that she would receive it soon. Herzog caught a lucky moment, and snatched the cane from the hands of Chloe, stunned by such behavior. The man was twisting the girl's thing in his hands. He was surprised that she bought herself a new one. She thought that this man was simply unbearable. The Duke was grinning, rather. He said that the girl seemed to be desperately trying to find her sister, so that she could argue with him this time. Chloe turned away. She thought that it would be bad if she was drunk again and got into a story or felt bad. The Duke urged the girl to go with him. He held out his hand to her, palm up, offering her his help in the search. He agreed that his castle was expanded. Therefore, he, as his master, undertook to take her everywhere. The Duke asked the girl if he was going too fast, but she answered him that everything is fine. He noticed that Chloe seemed to have practiced walking on her own quite a lot, and I thought it was supposed to be terribly painful. The girl squeezed his hand, holding on to walk. She said that his lordship was too kind to her. The blonde grinned. He said that she still has a fighting spirit, or perhaps she has become more experienced. Chloe was shaking. 
She gripped the man tighter, and she thought that if she had not allowed the Duke to take her cane, she would not have listened to him now. The couple walked along the garden path paved with stones. Demian noticed that the wind had picked up here. He asked the companion who put these ornaments on her. Chloe begged for forgiveness, asking him again, but the man was waiting for her answer. Looking at her feet, the girl confessed that she had made her own decorations. Herzog said that it was not surprising for him, and he considered it a complete mess. Chloe asked him to please return her cane. He answered that he was not sure if it was worth it. Demian said that he was informed that a young girl had been seen running excitedly in this direction, and he said that he had a feeling that it could be Chloe's sister. Our heroine remembered Alice, and as she instructed her not to get into trouble, she directly begged her. They heard languid sighs nearby and stopped. Chloe was horrified. Her sister Elisa was hugging a man. He kissed her wherever he wanted, and she allowed him to do so, enjoying his caresses. Damien was amazed, though he looked reserved, and Chloe was just confused. Elisa pushed the brunette away from her. She ordered him to leave, and she said that they would kill him if they caught him, and he answered that he would gladly part with his life right here. She asked him please, calling her by name Eddie. Chloe was amazed. She remembered the conversation with her sister, but she admitted that she ran into a gypsy the other day at a village festival, and he turned out to be so intriguing, he told her that his name was Eddie. Elisa dreamily said that now she was burning with the hope of meeting him again. Chloe staggered at the shocking guess, it turned out that her sister had been dating this gypsy all this time. The Duke took Verdier by the shoulder. He anxiously asked her if she was all right. The girl bowed to his lordship, apologizing to him. The gypsy ran into the nearby bushes of the garden. Alice panicked. She excitedly said that Eddie appeared as if out of nowhere and caught her by surprise. Chloe harshly ordered her sister to shut up immediately. The young girl was trembling all over. Chloe offered her deepest apologies to his lordship and asked his permission to be absent for a second while she sent her sister away. Damien answered her as she herself wished. The girl briefly thanked him, and Elisa felt uneasy. Chloe coldly ordered her frightened sister to get back into the carriage immediately. Alice ran away in tears. Chloe looked after her. The Duke said that the name of Verdi's second daughter seems to be on everyone's lips again. The girl frowned at his words. Damien continued to add fuel to the fire. He said that the girl's talent became the epicenter of a scandal every time she appeared in social society. Chloe begged and begged the man. Her hands were shaking. She asked the Duke not to tell anyone about this incident. Damien asked her why he would hide the truth about her sister. He said that he was absolutely sure, and she was perfectly aware that no one would blame him if he ordered her family for the crime committed, which consisted in bringing a stranger to his estate. Chloe stood leaning on a cane and bowed her head to the Duke. The girl understood that their family was doomed if she could not convince the Duke to keep silent about what had happened here. Therefore, she had to persuade him by any means. Chloe knelt down and bowed her head to the ground. She said that it was all her fault that she could not follow her stupid sister. She asked Duke de Maine Thys to punish her instead of her younger sister. She prayed to the ego on her knees. The man coldly asked what she would do if he refused her this. The girl was shocked. Her heart beat uncontrollably, which seemed to ring in her ears. The girl told herself that it was necessary to come up with something without wasting time. She swallowed nervously, realizing that her father and Elisa were hanging on her. She said that the Tease house is a family that values honor above all else. She reminded Demian that he was the only heir, an outstanding military leader who led his army to a great victory in the war, and the first to be awarded the Order of Merit by the king. The man ordered her to continue her flattering words. He made a disgusted face. The girl reminded him of his words that he would do anything to lead his soldiers to victory, and he would bring glory to those who fought side by side with him in the war. She reminded that it was at this time that the lord of the remote castle opened the gates to his soldiers and showed them hospitality. Although he himself did not take up arms, his support turned out to be invaluable. The duke clarified that in other words, the girl wanted him to return the debt, because that is precisely the custom of the noble house of Tees. Chloe replied that she only asked him to show a little generosity to their modest family for past merits. Damien asked if he had not already repaid them by inviting her and her sister to the company of the most respected noble families of the kingdom. He said that Chloe should have blamed her own sister for trampling on this opportunity, and he asked if the girl had anything else to tell him. The girl grabbed the duke by the boot and pressed him to her head. He asked what she was doing. The Viscountess asked only this time. If he could have mercy on them, she would do whatever he wanted. Chloe held the duke by the boot. She said that she would never forget his kindness. The girl was in complete despair. Damien held her chin. He asked her why she did it, and he raised her head from the ground with his hand, looking into her eyes. The duke asked the girl where the noblewoman, 
who held her head high, had gone. He expressed his surprise that now she was clinging to his legs and moaning that she would do anything for him. He said that it was not to her face. The sharp sounds of explosions and the evening sky illuminated by sparks heralded the start of the fireworks. The Duke guessed that the reason Chloe begged him on her knees was because her sister was missing. He understood that this was the only hope to save the situation of their family. Her or her sister's marriage to a rich nobleman was to take place. And this was supposed to be a shortage by calculation. If Elisa had married, the question would have been resolved. She had more chances for that. Young, healthy, and beautiful. Damien asked Chloe about her personal life. I was surprised that he didn't care about himself at all. The girl replied that she didn't care about herself. She assured that it is happiness for her to see people dear to her surrounded by care. The Duke asked if she was ready to do anything for this goal. The girl replied that she was ready to make all her efforts. The man frowned. He thought it was interesting. He said that then he should have thought about what Chloe could do for him in return. In the meantime, he advised her to return to the Verdier estate. He caressed her cheek. The girl replied that she would gladly do it. But His Majesty asked him to introduce Alice to him. The Duke replied that if the girl from this moment on tried to attract the attention of Johannes or the second man in the kingdom, he would have to kill her and her family with his own hands. Demian ran his finger over the lips of the vicar Tessa. He said that his generosity had its limits. The man added that he advises to refrain from visiting this place with people whom she did not trust. He said that lovers often visit this garden to indulge their passions. He said that only if she does not expect that such rumors will be spread about them. They had to leave it separately. Chloe remained sitting on the garden grass alone in thought. She was trembling a little. She pursed her lips tightly and following the duke, thought what a scoundrel he was. Chloe was sitting in her father's chair in the study and writing a letter. His Highness Duke Damien Ernst von Tissa, Mr. Duke, I am writing with the hope that the letter will find you in good health. Three months have passed since my return from the refined city of Svan, where the air is permeated with the delicate aromatic smell of roses. There is talk of a marriage between my sister Alice and the gentleman she met at the ball that day. Our family is incredibly happy because he is a noble man with high moral principles. I am well aware that these are all the fruits of your generosity. After thinking for a long time about how I can repay you for your kindness, I came to the conclusion that... The girl stopped and reread what had already been written, and she considered the last phrase redundant. It was three months later at the Verdier estate in the summer. Chloe sat, thinking how to paraphrase, preserved her dignity, but expressed her gratitude to the Duke. The door creaked, and Gilles appeared on the threshold. The boy told Lady Chloe that he had brought her some snacks. The girl briefly thanked him for his concern. She asked the servant how Alice was doing. He answered that the girl went out for a short time in the morning, but since then she has not left the room. Gilles also reported that the young lady refused food, complaining of stomach pain. He placed the tray on the table, clinking the dishes a little. Chloe clarified whether her sister had met that gypsy again, remembering how she had seen them in a passionate embrace then in the Duke's garden. The guy said that he doesn't think so. It seemed to him that Lady Alice had grown up since that time. Chloe agreed with him. After all, she had to take everything more seriously considering her engagement to Count Cormier. Chloe considered the Count a good man, and he also held a high position in society. She hoped very much, and was almost sure that her sister Elisa would be happy with him. After all, it will be a better match for a noble girl than a vagrant gypsy. Gilles turned to Mrs. What if Lady Alice got married, that he was afraid that Chloe would be very lonely? The girl was surprised that the servant was so worried about her. He apologized, and said that it was certainly not his business. Chloe assured that she will not be lonely. After all, she still had him, Gilles. She thanked Ego for the concern. The servant was already ready to bow, but Chloe stopped him. She said that since he was already here, why should he not look at her writing? And she said that she was writing to thank Duke Tis for the invitation to the ball. But it seemed to her that something was missing in the message. Chloe knew that the Duke was quite irritable. Therefore, no matter what she writes, he will still find flaws. Gilles began to reread her letter. The guy replied that if he had such a bad character, he would probably be no less angry if he did not receive this letter on time. A man burst in the door. He tried to say something to his dear Chloe, but he couldn't catch his breath from the fast running and the emotions that overwhelmed him. Father told her to get ready. After all, Duke Tissy himself is heading to their estate right now. A smile shone on the man's face. The man said that the Duke was going to hunt with them. Chloe was stunned. Her father told her that as she knew, their lesbolo was full of wild animals. The girl began to tremble a little. She could not understand why the Duke had traveled such a long way for the sake of pleasure. 
Viscount Verdier said that he learned about it quite recently, and it seemed that he would arrive earlier than expected, and our heroine again felt the coldness of the snake above her. The man said that considering the Duke's passion for hunting, it was not surprising that he was in such a hurry here. The Viscount, accompanied by his eldest daughter and servants, went out to meet the guests. He greeted his lordship. He assured that it was a great honor for him to receive him here. The man expressed the hope that the hot heat did not tire the Duke too much, and asked how he was doing. Duke Tiss noticed that the vicar had much fewer servants than before. He confusedly replied that there had been a bad harvest in recent years. Chloe said that unfortunately the castle was still a mess. After all, they received the news of his arrival too late. But she assured that everything possible was done to make his stay here comfortable. The Duke replied that he remembered her words, that a nobleman who does not know hospitality did not deserve his title. Verdier's castle greeted the Duke with its hospitality. The Duke himself sat at the head of the table. The Viscount expressed the hope that his lordship would forgive them. He asked for forgiveness that his youngest daughter would not join them because she was not feeling well. Demian, smiling, expressed the hope that nothing serious had happened to the girl. The Viscount thanked Ego for his concern. The Viscount expressed his gratitude to the Duke for this magnificent meal that they had prepared for them. He apologized, because it was they who were supposed to occupy the guests and entertain them. Demian said that he enjoyed it, and he expressed regret that it seems that Lady Chloe did not like the dish. The girl said that it seems that the heat of this season affected her appetite. Herzog said that it would be useful to increase her resistance to weather conditions. Wycon said that it seemed to him that his daughter was a little nervous because of the presence of his lordship at this table. He said that his daughter loves the forest so much that she can be seen asleep with a book in the shadows. The duke said that if this was so, then the girl must have known the area well. The owner of the castle said that everything is like that. Vicon assured that it would not be an exaggeration to say that the forest leading to the mountains was her personal garden. He recalled the case when she got seriously ill after returning from a walk, and yet, after so much suffering she continued to go to the forest. The duke could not believe it. And the Viscount recalled that this was approximately at the same time when his lordship and the soldiers were staying with them in the castle of Verdier. Gilles poured the lady clean water into her glass. He asked my lady if everything was all right with her, and he said that she does not look good. Chloe thanked the servant for the water. The duke said that if Lady Chloe loved the forest so much, he would like to ask her to accompany him on the hunt tomorrow. The Viscount sighed and said that she would only interfere with his lordship because of her condition, and he asked for permission to find someone who would be more useful in the hunt. But Damon's ego got the better of him, and he said that he would like to hear Lady Chloe's opinion. Our heroine clutched the hem of her dress with her hands. The girl knew that there is only one answer to the duke's question. Chloe replied that if his lordship would allow her servant to lead the horse, she would gladly accompany him on a hunt in the forest. Damien answered her no. The duke said that she was his lady, and that's why Chloe will go with him on his horse. He assured her that, as she herself understood, he was not used to following others. At the appointed time, our heroine was ready to go hunting. She was wearing a modest trouser suit. The duke met her near the stables. Demian gestured and verbally urged the girl to join him. Chloe wondered if it was safe. After all, she used to take only leisurely walks on horseback but never hunted. The duke urged the girl to hurry, but she didn't know if she could trust this man. Chloe handed the servant a cane and asked him to hold it. He asked my lady if everything would be all right with her. Damien sat astride, holding out his hand, and the vicar looked gratefully into the eyes of the servant Gilles. When the duke and Chloe were already driving through the forest, he asked her that she must have been very close to that guy. The girl said that their servant Gilles had been with their family since he was very young. She said that at the time when other servants were leaving due to unpaid wages, the guy preferred to stay with them. And since then, for her family, Gilles has become much more than just a servant. The duke spurred his horse. Tot galloped off. Chloe just gasped in fright and clung to the horse's mane. Damien asked the girl in which direction. He hurried her, specifying whether they should turn to the right or to the left. She stuttered and barely squeezed out what was left. Horses galloped, dogs barked. The duke again clarified the necessary direction with Chloe. The girl shouted that they needed to turn left. The horse went into a trot. After some time, the duke stopped the horse in a clearing. He growled and beat his hoof on the ground. The girl was catching her breath. Demian said that it looked like his people had caught a deer, and a rather large one at that. He said that Chloe really knew the forest well, and she thought that the duke did it on purpose to torment her. Considering him a devil in the flesh, Demian covered the Victosa's forehead with his hand, calming her fear of the fast ride. He urged Lady Chloe to breathe more deeply. He told her in a gentle tone that everything was over, and that everything will be fine. The evening descended on the Verdier estate. 
The windows of the building burned with a soft, warm light. Chloe said that she would send for a doctor as soon as it dawned. The Viscount was alarmed. He heard about the doctor. He explained to his daughter what happened. The girl replied that his lordship had suffered during the hunt. She said that he was attacked by a wild animal, so his wound had to be examined by a specialist. The youngest daughter, fulfilled, asked his lordship if he had suffered much. The duke said that he was wounded when he gave chase on foot. He realized that his desire to ride a horse did not give him the sharp sensations he wanted. The duke stuck his fork into the fish steak. Alice told him that if his wound was small, Chloe could sew it up. She scolded her sister for bragging. But the girl continued her speech. She apologetically told the guests that their family did not have pain relievers on hand. Alice said that the duke would have to endure pain in that case. Chloe assured his lordship that the doctor would have done such a job much better. But her younger sister assured her that now, when summer came, dozens of villagers fell ill from food poisoning every day. And only one doctor dealt with them. Damien was wiping his face after eating, and he assured that he certainly did not want to take away such a valuable resource from the people in their possession. After all, he was just a guest here, the duke said, addressing Chloe, if she would consider it a difficulty to visit him after dinner. The eldest of the sisters was sure that it would be wiser to send for a more competent person. The owner of the mansion also thought it would be wiser to do so, and he asked the important guest for permission to send for the doctor right away. Damien told him that a few years ago, when his soldiers were staying in this castle, the sight of Lady Chloe tending to their wounds made a deep impression on him. He said that he believed that the girl would make it this time too. The Viscount was amazed and beamed with joy that the Duke remembered this. Duke Tease assured, looking at Chloe, that he had not forgotten a single detail of what had happened on these lands. A little later, our heroine walked down the corridor. She felt like a prisoner who was being led to the gallows. She carried antiseptics and instruments in her hands. Damien was flipping through a book when a girl knocked on his door. When she timidly entered, the man told her that a simple request should not inspire such horror. Lady Chloe asked the Duke to show her his wound. Tot was sitting with his feet on the bed. He replied, Why don't you examine his wound yourself? The girl sat down on the ottoman. He replied that in that case he should at least roll up his sleeves. Breaking away from the book, Duke Tiss expressed his confidence that Chloe is capable of many things. The girl said that with all her respect, it was indecent for an unmarried woman like her to touch a man's body. Duke Damien marveled at her old-fashioned principles. The book fell to the floor. He said that perhaps she was right and began to unbutton his shirt. Soon the man threw his clothes on the floor and exposed his torso. Chloe was shocked. Demian told the girl that he knew that it might be difficult for her to resist. But he thought that it would be better if she did not look at him in such a surprised way. The face of the Vivoctessa flashed with paint. She thought that she hadn't asked the Duke to take off his shirt. But soon she gathered her will and confidently treated the wound with an antiseptic. Chloe warned the man that it might hurt. He answered that he wanted her to make him suffer as much as possible. He recalled that earlier the girl said that her mentor was a doctor. The girl confirmed it. Herzog assumed that this became useful in such cases. Chloe was already holding a needle and thread in her hands. The girl said that she really learned a little about medicine from him, but this was a completely different direction than she was using now. The Duke wondered what it was. Chloe replied that embroidery was now more useful to her for applying stitches to the wound. The Duke laughed. He said that this is the first time in his life that he regards embroidery as a useful activity. Chloe agreed with his opinion. The man asked her about her younger sister. After all, she arranges secret love meetings after dark. The girl was stunned. The Viscountess asked the Duke to refrain from talking for the time being. After all, now he had to be as still as possible. But he continued to insist on answering his question. Chloe said that from that night, her sister realized the wrong way. And thanks to his lordship, there were rumors of a marriage between her and Count Cormier. She expressed her gratitude to the Duke for that. The girl applied a stitch to the skin. Damien said that if he had known that his silence would reward him with three months of silence on her part, then he would never have shown her such mercy. Chloe told his lordship that he was very close to her. He ignored her appeal, but insisted on answering his question. The girl answered, looking at the floor, that she was writing letters to him. The duke replied that he had not received a single one. Chloe said that she could not bring herself to send them. Damien said that her pitiful attempts to lie disappointed him. The girl pushed the duke away from her, and her heart beat faster. She asked him not to be so close to her. He asked Chloe to tell him the truth. The girl said that it was all because he hated her. Her answer surprised the duke but did not satisfy him. The Viscountess said that she was perfectly aware of how unbearably repulsive he found her, and that's why she didn't decide. She said that she was not sure how exactly she should repay him. Chloe apologized to the duke. She would get up and feverishly prepare to leave him. 
She said that she was done with what she had come for, but something went wrong. The girl tripped, carrying a tray with a dressing kit. Her supporting leg slipped, and the girl began to fall on her back, overturning everything she was carrying on the floor. It was not for nothing that Duke Tiss was in good physical shape. He reacted like lightning and caught Chloe by the waist. The rumble of falling instruments was still in my ears, and the girl was lying on the Duke's bed. He hovered over her, leaning on his hands. Chloe realized that she had made a mistake. She noticed that a fresh seam on the Duke's hand came apart, revealing an open wound. She was horrified. He drew attention to the seam. Tot countered that she could always sew again. The girl was noticeably nervous. She asked Damien what he really wanted from her. The man stroked her strands of hair. Then he brought them to his face and kissed them. He said that she already knows the answer to this question. Chloe said that she was here only at the request of her father. The Duke sighed reproachfully, and he asked if she really thought that this was all that her father wanted. The girl thought that they had a similar dialogue three years ago. The Viscountess said that she understood why he questioned people's intentions. After all, he learned not to trust others on the battlefield. However, the girl assured the Duke that his thoughts that every woman in the kingdom desperately wanted to marry him were selfish delusions. Damien laughed, and our heroine did not understand what a funny thing she said to him. The man burst out laughing. Chloe thought that he was really out of his mind. Laughing, the Duke offered to test her theory in practice. He pulled the girl by the hand, helping her to stand up. They were sitting on the edge of the bed. Demian told the girl that she can go now, because she did what she came here for. Closing the door to her room behind her, Chloe regained her breath and tried to slow down her accelerated pulse. He limped to the mirror at the dressing table. She chastised herself for previously tormenting herself with the question of how she would thank such a terrible person. Chloe picked up the gloves. She thought that it would be stupid of her to give it to him. Boiling from her overwhelming emotions, she thought that she should have taken a thicker needle to stitch him up. He crumpled the gloves in his hands. She put them back on the table. Chloe told herself that she couldn't let her emotions get the better of her. After all, thanks to the Duke, Alice met Count Cormier. Our heroine went to the window and opened it wide, enjoying the evening coolness. Chloe looked at the evening starry sky. She reassured herself that when her sister Elisa gets married, their affairs will begin to adjust and everything will be fine. In the morning there was a commotion in Verdier's mansion. Herotzog Tis once again distinguished himself with his creativity, taking people by surprise. Alice asked her sister if she was sure that the Duke had injured his arm and not his head. The Viscount nervously asked his lordship whether he had heard that correctly. Damien was drinking tea. He put the cup on the saucer, and he repeated his words, paraphrasing them a little, that the lack of the daughter of the executed Lady Alice Verdier suggests. Both girls and their father were amazed by such an unexpected and no less unexpected proposal of the Duke. Viscount was the first to overcome himself. He laughed and said that there were already negotiations about marriage between his daughter and Count Cormier. Count Tis replied that this fact did not change his desire to offer his hand and heart to the girl. Smirking, Damien said that it seemed he wasn't good enough for Lord Verdier. Once he continues to make inappropriate comments, an eerie silence hung in the living room. Elisa nervously turned away and rubbed the hem of her dress. The owner of the estate told his lordship that this was definitely not the case. The father of the family said that regardless of his opinion, he must respect his daughter's wishes. The duke set down the empty cup. He said that he was sure of such a need, and announced a three-day deadline for reflection. He was getting up, about to leave the guest room. Damien adjusted the cuffs of his sleeves, and he announced that in the meantime, he was going to stay at his estate nearby. He chuckled, and he expressed the hope that they would carefully consider his proposal. Alice was lying face down on the bed. She said that she never wanted to be a duchess. The girl was crying and blowing her nose. The younger of the sisters told the older that she perfectly understands and realizes what an opportunity this was for them. Chloe was standing next to her, trying to comfort her. She thought to herself what the Duke was thinking, and why did he make such an unexpected proposal. But then she remembered his words in order to test her theory in practice. The sister stroked the younger one on her back. The sister confidently told Alice that she did not have to agree at all if she did not want to, and she promised to talk to her father. The girl turned around and called out to her sister, but did not find anything to say to her, but simply hugged her sincerely. Elisa asked what would happen to them if something suddenly went wrong and she couldn't get married. After all, now that the Duke has made a proposal, this will put an end to relations with Cormier. The girl tried to say something else, but Chloe asked her not to cry and promised that everything would be fine with them. She assured her younger sister that some time would pass and she would receive many proposals for marriage. She asked her not to worry and to suffer a little more. 
Alice's shoes were taken off and stood next to her bed. The girl timidly said that she was in love with Eddie. Chloe answered her sister that this is a man, but she stunned her with the statement that she is carrying a child from him under her heart. Alice confusedly asked her sister what she should do now. Tears flowed down the girl's face. Already late in the evening, our heroine was sitting on the bed in her room. She couldn't get the conversation with her sister out of her head. Her head hurt and she rubbed her forehead. And in front of the girl's eyes was the confused and tearful face of her sister Elisa. Chloe thought that all this could happen due to the fact that she and her father put such an overwhelming burden on her. And this was the price for their selfishness. The girl decided that in such a case, it was necessary to prevent this marriage at any cost. She decided that first, she had to convince their father of this. Morning at the Verdier mansion. The Viscount was surprised by Chloe's early rise, that she had already come to him to talk about Elisa's marriage. The girl said that she had thought about it. The man said that he too was thinking about it all night. Viken lowered his head and said that the very prospect of Elisa's marriage to a representative of the Tees' house pleased him, but at the same time worried him. The daughter asked to explain these words to her. The man said that the Tees' family was a family that valued nobility, and this meant that they would never send Elisa away, even if they found her character or behavior unpleasant. And Duke Tees certainly knew what a cruel fate awaited a divorced woman in their kingdom. Chloe put the cup on the saucer. She told her father that she had something to say. Viscount saw his daughter's indecision and was also excited. Chloe fidgeted with the hem of her dress in indecision. An excited Gilles burst into their room without asking. He informed Lady Chloe and Lord Verdier that Alice was missing. Surprise was on the faces of close people. The Count was the first to come to his senses. He approached the servant and asked him again why he got that. The guy held out a folded piece of paper. He said that he found it in Alice's room. The man impatiently asked to let him see, and he took the paper and began to read it fluently. Wycon read aloud, and Chloe listened, leaning on the cane of the ego. To my beloved father and dearest sister, a little later the girl sat on the bed and reread it herself. Thanks to you, I learned that true love can overcome both illness and death. Chloe's tears dripped uncontrollably onto the paper. Because you are living proof of the power of love, and the proof itself that there is no such thing as forbidden love. Now I renounce the name of Verdier and will live like Alice. I apologize to my father. Do not forgive me for such a selfish concession. Chloe, I'm sorry. I hope that one day I will be presented with a chance to atone for my guilt. After reading, the Count staggered and fell straight to the floor. Even though I am an ungrateful daughter, please know that I am sincere when I say that I love you. With a heavy heart and a thousand apologies. Alice. In the morning, Chloe sat by the bed of her sick father. He was still lying in bed after reading. He addressed his daughter with affectionate words, and he asked if she knew about this situation with her sister. The girl sat with a lowered gaze in front of her father. There was a photo of their entire family on the bedside table. Chloe answered that she vaguely guessed that there was a man, that Alice was not indifferent. The Viscount had a daughter, but she did not inform him, and that fact said that she did not approve of the attitude of her younger sister. And if she even found him unpleasant, then that man was an unworthy scumbag. Chloe replied that if Elisa ran away with him, despite her objections, she was sure that he must have been a worthy man. The girl put her hand on her father's hand, and she said that she trusted her sister and her choice. She promised Dad that everything would be fine, and she asked him to focus on his speedy recovery. She said that everything that concerned the Duke of Tees, she asked to be given to her. She said, smiling to her father, that she was going to talk to him frankly and heart to heart like adult aristocratic people. When our heroine left her father, she found Gilles, and she asked the guy if he intentionally let Elisa leave. Chloe said that she understood this from the moment he brought them the letter. After all, the guy would never enter her room without permission. The servant said that he saw no point in hiding it from her. The girl said that she was grateful to him that he was next to her sister at that moment. Chloe admitted that she herself was not sure how to do it right, and now she was grateful to Gilles that he helped Alice escape. The girl was ready to put up with what happened. She said that now... They had to courageously endure the misfortune that befell them. Gilles called out to Lady Chloe. Her hands were shaking. The guy expressed the hope that she would not blame herself for what happened. The young servant asked her not to think that she should take responsibility for this. The boy's hands were clenched into fists and trembling. The girl said that she does not know how to live with these people. Chloe understood that she was the only person who at this moment was capable of looking after the Verdier estate. She assured that she would definitely find a way for them all to survive, and I even agreed to make a very dangerous choice. A glass with alcohol and ice was placed on the table. Duke Tees was enjoying the sunset on the veranda of his estate. Three days later, Lady Chloe Verdier appeared in person at the Duke of Tees's estate. 
Demian said that it was quite unexpected for him, and he assumed that his proposal was considered so agreeable that she decided to personally inform him about the decision. Chloe assured that it was not something that could be discussed in writing. The Duke asked if his guest was suffering from an infectious disease. The girl replied that she was not sure what he was talking about. Demian said that if this was not so, then why didn't she come closer to him? The man invited the guest to come to him and sit next to him, showing the place with the palm of his hand. Chloe stood clutching the handle of her cane. The Duke was surprised that she decided to ignore his orders. The girl took restrained steps and sat next to the Duke, making titanic efforts on herself. Demian said that the wound on his hand is not healing. The Viscountess asked if he had called a doctor about this. His answer was negative. The Duke asked Chloe if she could apply the salve to him. There was a suitcase full of vials of medicine on the floor. The girl's face had an expression that said, You have no hands, Your Grace? Damien assured, looking at the girl, that he could easily tell what she was thinking just by looking at her face. Chloe grabbed one of the bubbles, and she said that the Duke is deeply mistaken. The man took his shirt off his shoulder and exposed his arm. The Viscountess told him that the weather was too hot now, and this did not contribute to healing at all. The girl convinced him that it would be better for him to be in the room. After all, spending time outside the estate will only complicate the recovery process. Demian said that the summer in the ancestral estate of Tis is not as pleasant as here. He assured that he liked the feeling of burnt skin from head to toe. Chloe finished applying the ointment and said that the Duke can now remove his hand. He asked her to answer why his offer was rejected. The girl replied that marriage was physically impossible for her sister now. Damien asked her to clarify what the reason was. Shutya assumed that Elisa had died. Chloe asked the Duke for permission to ask him a question before she revealed the truth. She clutched the hem of her dress, gathering herself with the strength of her spirit. The Duke commanded forward. The girl asked if there was a reason why he wanted to marry her sister and Chloe herself. The water lapped the shore, creating lush foam at the edges. Demian became curious why the girl decided that way. She clarified whether his intention was to enter her family in order to completely destroy her life. The Duke snorted. Then he laughed. He asked Chloe if she remembered how she had recently told him. It is a selfish delusion to think that every woman in the kingdom desperately wants to marry you. Demian grinned and replied that he would have said that Lady Chloe herself was self-absorbed to the point of ignorance. The girl shuddered all over. The Duke continued his thought, asking that the girl really believed that he was marrying the daughter of an unremarkable and in-debt man was executed only to inform her, Elisa's sick sister. The Viscountess said that he was right and it was unlikely. Demian said that sometimes she is surprisingly funny, and he asked if she noticed something behind her. The girl confessed that she did not know, and did not notice such a thing. And then she thought that the Duke was really in love with her sister Alice. The man laughed again. He asked if he looked like a romantic who would believe that marriage should be based on love. Chloe had only one last guess, and all this meant that there was only one explanation left, why the Duke proposed to her sister. After all, there must have been some weighty reason for marrying Verdier's daughter, which the Duke could not reveal. Demian asked her to continue to reason along these lines. The girl voiced that if there were reasons why he should refuse to marry the most enviable lady of the kingdom for the sake of a daughter from a low-status family, the Duke probably didn't care who he actually married, and this meant that he might even prefer to marry a woman with such a noticeable flaw that no one would even look at her twice. The man asked to give an example. Chloe answered that, for example, it could be a woman who was left with the ability to use one leg. And the girl was sure that if she had lost both legs, then perhaps she would have become an even more ideal bride for him than she was now. The Duke held Chloe's chin. He looked into her eyes. At some point he kissed her. The girl clasped the hem of the dress with her hands. Demian pushed his tongue into the girl's mouth. She continued the kiss more deeply. Chloe flinched as the Duke stood up and loomed over her. The Duke broke away from her lips, catching his breath. The girl grabbed his hand. She asked what he was doing. Chloe turned away from the man. He said that she always made so many remarks that he wanted to know how sharp her tongue really could be. Damien supposed that this was a wonderful opportunity to find out if she could conceive an heir for him. The Duke continued to kiss the girl's neck and back from behind. The courtesies were interrupted by a resounding slap from the Vicatess. The man clearly did not expect this and was in prostration for some time, stunned. Chloe blamed his lordship for doing something similar when he hadn't even responded to her proposal yet. She thought that it was blatant disrespect. The Viscountess took a deep breath, exhaling noisily. Meanwhile, the man licked himself protectively. He said that this was a truly real resistance. Damien stood up. He said that, however, he advised the executive to reacquaint himself with the principles of conducting negotiations. The man was buttoning his shirt. 
Duke Damien Tiss ordered the guest to step away. Chloe did not understand what effect she achieved with her visit. A few days later, our heroine was sitting in the living room of Verdier's ancestral mansion. Thoughts in her head were confused. She unconsciously touched her lips with her fingers. The girl remembered that kiss of the Duke and still felt his taste on her lips. A male voice brought the girl out of this trance. At first it seemed to her that the Duke had called her. She shuddered. But her name was actually Gilles. He asked Lady Chloe if she was all right, because he noticed that she was too pale. The Viscountess assured the servant that everything was fine with her, and she asked what they stopped with him. Gilles said that after sending a congratulatory message on the occasion of the engagement, the royal family continued to send gifts to Lady Alice. And that's why there was still a pile of carts in the garden, filled to the brim with gifts. Gilles asked the lady for permission to ask how her negotiations with the Duke went and whether they were successful. Chloe wondered if her guess was correct. After all, Prince Johannes is the official heir to the royal throne. But there was also a man whose power was not inferior to the royal family and who enjoyed the respect of the people. It was the Duke of Tees. She thought that the royal family must have been delighted by the news that the Duke, whose power had grown disproportionately, was marrying the daughter of a commoner. Instead of strengthening ties with a noblewoman from a high-ranking family, Chloe thought that the Duke of Tees himself was well aware of this. The servant knocked and asked for permission, entered, opened the door with a report for the mistress. The guy bowed to Chloe and said that a distinguished guest had arrived. The girl asked in surprise who he was. The servant quietly told her that it was Duke Tees himself, and he clarified with her whether he should report this to the hostess. Our heroine involuntarily shuddered. The girl answered the servant that her father was sick, and he should not have worried. She went to meet the duke herself in the face of the hostess, and she asked to ask the guest to wait for her in the living room. Chloe said that she wanted to clean herself up and meet the duke later. Damien greeted the girl. He said that he already wanted her. The girl and the servant Jills were equally surprised. The duke asked why such emotions of surprise instead of greeting. He was pleased with himself and smiled, sitting in a carved chair. Chloe voiced his lordship that it was the height of indecency to enter the lady's empty bedroom without an invitation. He replied that he couldn't help himself because he missed her immensely. The Viscountess told the Duke that this was her personal space, and she was going to arrange for the servants to take him to the guest room. But the man took steps towards her. Damien asked in a gentle voice if it was really necessary. He played with the strands of her hair with his fingers. Gilles was surprised and simply grew closer to the floor. The Duke told Chloe that soon their relationship would pass the point where they would not need to be alone with each other. The servant was stunned. As soon as the Duke noticed the boy, he barked at him to get out and close the door behind him. Slamming the door lock, the servant Gilles endured the emotions he had experienced. His fisted hands trembled. The Duke said that these jewels were passed down from generation to generation in the house of Tees. A box with a necklace and earrings was on the table. Damien said that if they had followed tradition, it was his mother who should have presented these jewels to her, her future daughter-in-law. But she did not fully approve of their union. Chloe said sadly that she understood, and it was expected of her. The Duke was surprised by her reaction. He asked if she pretended to be calm, or if she really didn't care. The Viscountess looked from under her forehead at the Duke. She replied that she was simply afraid to react too hastily, because she didn't know what words would come out of his mouth the next moment. She asked Demyon if his gift meant that he was accepting her offer, Toth briefly confirmed this fact. The Duke took the necklace in his hands, and he told Chloe to consider this as a proposal. The man asked the vicar, holding out his bejeweled hand to her, Chloe Verdier, will you become my wife? The girl bowed her head and answered that she was sincerely grateful that he accepted her offer. Demian was surprised by such a wording of the answer, and he asked how she was going to prove it to him. Chloe said that she would do everything in her power to help the Duke in every endeavor he would undertake, no matter what it was. Demian asked what she thought he might want. The girl thought for a while. The duke asked Chloe if he had to run his tongue over her parched lips to get her to open her mouth. At these words, the girl blushed shyly. The viscountess swallowed nervously, said that she believed that the duke wanted power, although she said that she was short-sighted to know exactly what he was really thinking. Demian said in a commanding tone that from this moment on she was forbidden to say such things in his presence. After all, he was absolutely sure that short-sightedness was not about Chloe. The Viscountess repeated that she would do everything in her power to help the Duke, and if he wishes in the future, then he will gladly divorce him, having granted his request. The man asked in surprise that she had already offered him a divorce. He considered it impudence. The Duke said that her arrogance enraged him. The girl asked for forgiveness if her words sounded rude, and she hoped that he would not misunderstand her intentions. 
Demian was interested in what her intentions were and what the girl hoped to get from him. Chloe clutched the hem of her dress, and she answered that she would like to become a duchess. The man stood up and walked towards her. Demian carefully put the ancestral necklace of the Tees family around the girl's neck. After he finished, he asked her what it was like to wear the jewels of the house of Tees around her neck. Chloe answered his lordship that they were quite heavy. The duke assured that this was nothing compared to the burden of responsibility that she would have to bear as the duke's wife, and he clarified whether she still wants to become his wife. Chloe answered in the affirmative. He added that she wanted this more than anything in the world. The man lifted the girl's chin with his hand and looked into her eyes. He asked how thoroughly she studied the issue of negotiations. The duke asked her what she thought he wanted at that moment. The girl grabbed the ego by the knot of the tie, and he pulled him passionately and kissed him on the lips. The man succumbed to her temptation and enjoyed the moment of tenderness. Their kiss lasted. Sounds and languid humming spoke of the passionate desire of the body. The girl tried to restrain herself. Her posture and clenched free hand spoke of this. The tongues of the partners touched. Deep sighs burst out. The girl tried to hold the duke by his tie. But he had already managed to break away from Chloe. He asked her if it was too much for her. The girl replied that she did not want to lie to him. The duke said that unfortunately, she would have to get used to it. After all, he was not going to stop there in the future. The Viscountess felt that she had fallen into a trap. The Viscount spoke to his dear daughter, that he had no idea that she had developed a relationship with the Duke. His lordship, holding the girl's hand, said that he expected her to become a good duchess. Lord Verdier assured, smiling, that his daughter would certainly be able to handle it, and he guaranteed it. He assured that Chloe is a sensible lady, and I was sure that she would win universal respect. The Viscount told the Duke that if he could just make his daughter happy, he would willingly offer him everything he had, including his own life. Demian's hand lay on top of the girl's hand. She saw embroidery on his glove. She wondered how he was able to find these gloves. After all, Chloe left them on the table in her room by the mirror. The Duke asked Lord Verdier if he would grant him the forest on the territory of this estate and the mountains leading to it. Viscount was surprised by such a request. He said that the soil there was barren, and it was difficult for the trees to find use. Damien said that these lands are revered by Lady Chloe, and it just so happened that it was there that everything between them started. Chloe felt like she had become a piece on Duke Thissy's chessboard, and that he will manipulate her to his advantage as he sees fit. The priest asked the newlyweds, Does he vow to always be close to his wife and fulfill his duty, despite all the trials and tribulations that fate has prepared for him? Our heroine stood in a wedding dress, with a bouquet of roses in front of the duke with her head held high. He looked into the bride's eyes and pronounced the traditional words of the oath. The priest said that now the bride and groom can kiss to cement their union before God. The girl closed her eyes. The duke leaned down and pecked her cheek. At her surprised look, he asked what she still expected from him. Damien was surprised that she expected something else from him. Disappointment was written on the bride's face. The girl's father stood in the first row of guests. He applauded and said that his dear Chloe looked beautiful. And next to him was the servant Gilles, with a confused and sad face. The priest said, By the will of the Lord God I declare you husband and wife. Damien was silent. Chloe was a little alarmed by this, because there was already some kind of idea on the face of the newly made spouse. The duke stayed a little, took his wife in his arms. Congratulations poured in for the duke and duchess. The girl asked her husband to put her on the ground. He asked if she intended to drag it out even longer and gently kissed her on the cheek. Chloe reached out and wrapped her arms around the duke's neck. Her husband praised her. People in the city speculated that the duke had left the Verdier estate as soon as the wedding ceremony in the church had ended. They were surprised that he rushed away without even spending the wedding night with his newlywed wife. Residents asked to understand whether this meant that the duchess would spend three months in the estate in complete solitude. Servant Gilles heard all this, but did not agree with it. The newspaper headlines of Red Vale were full of news from his personal life. Couldn't even marriage extinguish the ardent passion of the Duke of Tees? The recently married Duke was seen having fun with Marquise Isabella. The events took place in the tailoring shop. Our heroine learned about the active social life of her husband from the newspapers. Her face was marked with sadness. The seamstress approached the customer. She promised my lady to immediately burn all this to ashes. The girl kept saying that there was no need for that. She put the fresh newspaper aside on the table, covered it with her hand, and she said that burning paper will not turn rumors into ashes. Chloe was checking to see if the seamstress had finished taking measurements, and she was going to bow down in that case. But she assured that they still needed to discuss materials and design. The lady said that she would leave all this to her discretion, considering that she herself was not very knowledgeable in these matters. 
The girl was leaving. Gilles escorted her to the threshold, bowing. The bell in the door jingled melodiously, touched by the door. The servant accompanied the mistress to the carriage. He said that men and their inability to control themselves will destroy this country. He suggested that Lady Chloe temporarily entrust the management of the estate to others. The carriage moved from place. Gilles said that he could also take care of the business on her behalf. The lady assured that everything was fine. The servant said that she could attract unwanted attention because of the article in the newspaper. But Chloe assured him that if people see that she, the Duchess, allows such baseless rumors to hurt her. Then, when the ceremony ended, the Duke, still in his wedding light suit, sat on a horse. He told his wife that now he intends to return to the capital. Chloe silently looked into his eyes. Her husband instructed her. He gave her the order to begin the Duchess's duties now. And now, when our heroine was sitting at the window of the carriage, she thought that her husband had not answered any of her letters in the last three months. She remembered that photo on the front page of the newspaper, and she wondered if this could be the reason for his silence. Chloe admitted to herself that she honestly did not expect anything from this marriage, and she assured herself that there was no reason to let this affect her. Gilles looked at the lady with an unblinking gaze. He told Lady Chloe that good news awaited her upon her arrival at the mansion. To her mute question, he clarified that a letter had arrived from Lady Alice, that it was small, but it seemed that she was in full health. The girl was all beaming with joy. She asked Jill why he didn't tell her about it earlier. The servant took on the emotions of the mistress and also felt happy with her. Chloe thought that now she knew her sister was safe and their father's health has improved significantly. And her wedding itself also inspired people in their domains. Moreover, the girl admitted to herself that she would in any case prefer to live separately from Damien. Chloe thought, if only there was an opportunity to live forever so peacefully. The carriage rolled further down the city street, and someone had thrown a newspaper with a photo of Duke Tees on the front page, lying on the stones of the threshold. Dinner at the estate. The stars lit up the sky more and more brightly. Chloe wrote a letter to her husband. As I have already mentioned in my previous letters, thanks to your lordship, everything is fine at the Verdier estate. I hope that the case, because of which you left, will be settled soon. I will write to you again if something worthy of attention appears. Sincerely, Chloe Verdier. The Duke held a piece of paper with a message from his wife in his hands and reread it again. He didn't like that she signed her maiden name because she was going to take his name. And right there on his desk lay the same newspaper with a scandalous article about the Duke and his personal life. The man turned his head in her direction. Demian assumed that his wife must have seen this article, but she didn't say a word to him. He was interested in what she felt at the same time. And did she shed tears of shame? The Duke believed that he knew her quite well and he assumed that Chloe must have been holding back her emotions as always. The girl did not suspect that it was her husband that annoyed her the most. The man chuckled. He flipped through the newspaper, reading the article. The secret affair of Duke Tees during the so-called honeymoon only strengthened the position of Prince Johannes, the heir to the royal throne. Meanwhile, rumors about the deterioration of the king's health continued to spread. The duke was pleased. The journalists wrote exactly what he told them to do. Damien mused, tapping his fingers to a rhythm on the table. He remembered his wife's words that she believed that his desire was power. He also remembered her promise to do everything in her power to help her husband in achieving his goal, and in every endeavor he undertook. Demian sighed, thought that unfortunately she was unable to help him in any way. The Duke himself admitted that whenever he thought of Chloe, he was overcome with a sudden desire to grab something. The girl asked for forgiveness, saying that she needed to go, and she expected them to give way to her walking with a cane. From the moment Damien saw her, she began to get on his nerves. It annoyed him to see her helping the needy, while she herself could easily pass for one of them. And the strange feeling at the sight of her only grew, leaving a sour taste in the mouth. The Duke looked at Chloe's embroidered gloves. He thought that next time he would have to lock her in a room and make her sew all day long. He thought that when the girl ran out of fabric, he would force her to embroider on him. The day was fine and sunny. A heavy cough was heard in the royal palace. The man hoarsely said that soon the Lord would take him to himself, and he expressed the hope to Duke Tisa that he would serve Johannes well even after his death. The king was sure that Damien was well aware that the prince was out of his mind. He asked the duke to swear before God that he would be devoted to Johannes. Damien said, narrowing his eyes, that he promises if he becomes a king worthy of his devotion. But such an answer did not satisfy the monarch. The king angrily asserted that it was the duty of every subject to be loyal to the king. Ego was stifled by a fit of coughing. The duke calmly told the dying monarch that in such a case it was absolutely obvious what awaited their country in the future. 
Demian announced that the one who, imperceptibly for everyone, has become crazy, will rule their kingdom. He was well aware of the weaknesses of the heir to the throne. But then he took his words back. He said that he was aware of Johannes's insanity, as well as the number of people who died at his hands. Demian assured that there were many rumors coming out of the royal palace that bloodied bodies of his victims were being dragged out one by one from the rooms of the heir to the throne. The duke assured that it would take quite a bit of time before the people found out that those words were not mere rumors. He told his majesty that he had risked his life on the battlefield for the sake of that man. The commander claimed that he was always ready to fight for his country, and he considered it right, but it was difficult for him to accept that a madman would rule everything. The king cleared his throat, then he menacingly asked the duke what he dared to hint at in front of him. Demian replied that now Johannes's madness is kept secret, but sooner or later everything secret will become clear. He got up from the chair next to the monarch's bed. The king angrily asked his subject, since when he asked such greedy ambitions. Damien walked around the room, and turning over his shoulder, he answered that it was from the moment he was born. Further events take us to the Verdier estate. Our heroine was sitting in the office and enthusiastically reading a book. At some point, the girl remembered that article from the newspaper about Duke Thys and Marquise Isabella. She presented how they have fun together. Chloe regretted not reading the article more carefully. But then she began to drive such thoughts away from herself. She told herself that she should forget about it completely. At some point, the girl's father, Lord Verdier, entered. He was in a great mood. The man was holding an envelope in his hands. He solemnly announced that dear Chloe had received a letter from his lordship. The girl shuddered. It seemed to her that her father was also worried about that scandalous news from the newspaper. Taking the envelope in her hands, she thought that Demian had not written anything to her since his departure to the capital. She sat comfortably in an armchair and began to read a letter from her husband. My beloved wife, Chloe Von Thies. Wait for me at the Thies estate, fulfilling my duchess duties there. I hope you are looking forward to our meeting as much as I am. Your husband Damien Ernst Von Tysa, the girl read to the end, swallowed nervously. Chloe stood on the threshold of her father's house, saying goodbye to her father. The Viscount spoke to Gilles, expressing the hope that he would safely accompany his daughter to the Thies estate. The servant told my lord that there was nothing to worry about. Chloe also confirmed this, assuring her father that she was no longer a small child. The man put his hands on his daughter's hands. He told her that she and her sister Elisa would always be his little girls. Chloe jokingly asked to let her guess that he will also call her, even when she becomes old. He confirmed that she was absolutely right. He said that he understood that she was now the duke's respectable wife, and that it should have been abandoned a long time ago. The girl was also sad. Chloe threw herself into her father's arms. He hugged his child to him with all the tenderness of a father. The girl mentally said that she would like to stay with him forever, and she promised him out loud that she would be fine. She said that her father himself saw how much the Duke cherished her. Chloe thought to herself how much she didn't want to leave for the Tees estate now, but she assured her father out loud that everything would be fine with her. The girl made a titanic effort and smiled herself, and she asked her father to let her go into married life with a smile. The train traveled along the rails, releasing clouds of steam from the pipe and announcing the surroundings with the loud sounds of the movement of its mechanisms. Our heroes were riding in one of the wagons. Gilles told Mrs. Chloe that he would be perfectly fine even in a freight car. The guy thought that this coupe was too chic for someone like him, and he looked at everything with interest, to which Chloe assured him that they had two whole days of travel ahead of them. And in addition, she will soon spend most of her time in complete solitude. The train drove through the mountains, their icy peaks were covered with snow, and there were yellowed meadows below. Gilles said that it seemed to be snowing. Chloe looked out the window and saw for herself. The girl and her accompanying servant Gilles arrived at the birch castle of Thys' house. They were already standing at his front door. A woman came out to meet Chloe. She greeted her ladyship. Then, in a mechanical voice, she introduced herself as Eliza, saying that she held the position of senior maid and manager. The girl thought that this castle was simply huge, and only one person came to meet her. It could only mean that they were not happy to be here. Chloe tapped her cane on the living room tiles. She thanked the maid for the warm welcome. The girl asked Eliza to prepare some food for her companion on the way back. She assured that the road here turned out to be quite tiring. The maid said, Okay. The senior maid said that she would ask the maids to prepare something for her servant, and she asked the guy to follow her. Chloe turned to her servant. She expressed regret that she would not be able to conduct it personally. She thanked him and asked him to take care of himself on the way. Eliza was seeing the girl off, and she was doomed to limp after her. The guy's face expressed sadness. Eliza informed her ladyship that Lady Chloe had arrived. The woman ordered to let her in. 
The girl politely introduced herself by name, and she said that it was a great honor for her to finally meet her. He bowed. She thanked him for giving her a carriage and taking her from the station. The woman authoritatively asked Chloe to look at her. The girl hesitantly looked up at the lady. The mother-in-law told the girl that she was quite pretty, and Chloe thought that the Duke must have gone to his mother. The lady told her daughter-in-law that she looked like the fawn Demian caught in his youth. She asked if Chloe was hiding fantastic riches, and did she have knowledge about the skeletons in the royal closet. The lady approached Chloe, clinking her rings. The girl answered her lordship in the negative. The woman summed up what it means that her son Demian chose his bride for other reasons, different from practical ones. The mother-in-law told the girl that she was really beautiful, but she thought that hunting a deer with a damaged leg for the sake of sporting interest was rather unusual for her son. The woman said that she simply could not believe her ears when Damien asked her for their family jewels to propose. She assumed that it could be curiosity. After all, from time to time, her son got pleasure from a sharp sensation. The mother-in-law continued to examine Chloe, turning her head and lifting her by the chin. The girl smiled and endured. Our heroine decided to speak out. She assured that his lordship would not make a decision about something serious out of short-term curiosity. Chloe said that she did not know the reasons for his choice, but his mother assured him that she would serve him with all her heart, despite her own shortcomings, and do everything possible to make the Tease house flourish. The blonde was surprised by this answer. She said that the girl turned out to be smarter than she thought. The lady said that the girl came to her liking. After all, with such a pretty face, her family jewels would suit her very well. And in addition, the girl had a good head on her shoulders. She assured that she did not expect a smaller son. After all, for him there is nothing in the world more important than family. The blonde asked how Chloe would react to the fact that when she is here, they will listen to stories about Damien's childhood. Already in the evening, Chloe got up in her room and immediately plopped down on the bed. The mother-in-law chatted with her about her son non-stop. The girl assumed that her husband had a strict upbringing. But judging by the way he was praised in front of his eyes and called, he was clearly adored in childhood. This quite tired the girl, who was just from the road anyway. Turning to her side, she saw a portrait of the Duke in a round frame. Reaching up, she put the ego down on the counter. She was surprised that Damien put his own portrait in his wife's bedroom. Chloe slept, and she dreamed that the Duke was looking at her directly from the portrait. The magical light spilled over the room. The mother-in-law told the girl that she was somewhat surprised, watching how she locked herself in the office for three days, having arrived here very recently. She was putting a cup on a saucer. The lady said with a laugh that her daughter-in-law looked like her son Demian. After all, as soon as he began to focus on something, he could not even notice the dawn. She asked Chloe what she wanted to discuss with her. The girl hesitated a little. 